Um, hello, um, good afternoon to everyone, and uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to be here today. Um, I'm really happy to uh, to present you our work uh, in uh, in my lab, in which we are trying to develop uh, bioinformatics tools to analyze uh, isoSeq data. And uh, basically, what we want to to do here is to go all the way from the long reads to the actual functional analysis of isoforms. And this is what we are calling now uh, the development of the functional isotranscriptomics uh, analysis. Um, and uh, before I start, I just have to, I mean, there, there have been a lot of people involved in this, in this project, but I especially have to thank these uh, um, three amazing scientists, uh, Hector, Lorena, and Manu, who have been uh, working uh, very closely together in uh, creating the set of tools that I'm going to uh, present today. So the way I'm uh, looking at uh, isoSeq data is really to understand uh, what, why isoforms are important. And we know that uh, depending on uh, the isoform that the gene may, may express, we may have uh, differences, you know, in binding sites of uh, the ability uh, uh, to change uh, the uh, uh, properties of uh, transcription factors or uh, bind binding to other uh, to other proteins, and this has uh, some kind of impact on how the regulation of the cell function. We also have differences uh, in isoforms at UTR regions that are involved in the regulation of these transcripts, but actually. The, um, the functional characterization of all this is really, really very poorly done uh, so far. And actually only 5% of alternative isoforms are today well characterized. So um, when I uh, started this project, uh, I wanted to, uh, to try to understand what was needed to do a real functional uh, isotranscriptomics uh, analysis. So uh, first, of course, you need good full-length transcripts to be able to, to say what, this is the difference between one isoform and another, okay? Um, to be able to say something uh, computationally about function, uh, you need to have rich uh, annotation of these uh, sequences so that you are able to differentiate what are the uh, functional elements that are included or excluded uh, among uh, isoforms. And, and then somehow you may need some uh, novel statistical methods to interrogate the data. So we have uh, today uh, uh, pack bio reads, uh, long reads that resolve these uh, um, uh, full length transcripts. And uh, so we have working on, on that to generate the, the primary data that we need for this kind of analysis. And we have been developing also some tools for the pre-processing of uh, uh, this uh, data that uh, I, will, I will present. Um, we created ISOANOT, which is a set of, uh, is a pipeline for uh, creating these rich uh, functional annotations. And finally, uh, to be able to really interrogate the data and come to functional hypotheses, uh, we have this cool uh, tool called uh, TAPAS. So um, I'm gonna, these are very, very large projects and I don't have the time to go into the details of all of them. Uh, basically, I will try to, to give you some sketches of uh, each of them so that you have an idea of uh, what we, how we are thinking about these things and maybe later we can talk uh, further. Um, so about Scanti, uh, oh, uh, before I continue, so we have been doing uh, these, uh, these developments uh, using uh, mouse uh, uh, neural differentiation system in which we start with uh, MPCs, with the neural progenitor cells, and we differentiate the two allodendrocytes and motor neurons. Okay, and uh, we have here a time course, and simply the data that we generated uh, uh, was on this system, and, and here we had pack bio and also matching Illumina data. So the SCANTI was developed as a, a quality control tool for the analysis of uh, isoSeq data. And basically what uh, we are doing here is that we start with our uh, transcripts um, generated by the isoSeq, uh, before it was the TOFU pipeline or the isoSeq pipeline. 
Uh, we may uh, also uh, have some information on expression. If we have uh, show reads, we can also indicate uh, uh, coverage. And then we have the reference genome and, and transcriptome. With all this, uh, we run this pipeline, uh, quality control pipeline, in which we generate a number of quality reports. But more importantly, uh, we characterize a number of features, both at the transcript and the um, uh, junction level. And with them, we are able to take this information and then uh, do some kind of uh, uh, quality control filtering, resulting in a transcriptome that uh, has passed uh, some uh, quality uh, control requirements. Uh, the, uh, the smart idea of uh, SCANTI was uh, to uh, create a categorization of, of uh, the uh, um, PacBio uh, uh, reads uh, for their um, similarity, uh, similarity with the reference. So then we have what we call full splice match. It basically is when my PacBio read matches the references uh, at uh, a reference transcript in all the junctions. The incomplete splice match misses some of them. Uh, these are known transcripts. We call these known transcripts. Then we have what we call the uh, the novel transcripts, and here we have these two categories: novel in catalog and novel not in catalog. Basically, these are novel combinations of existing junctions, where here we can have a novel donor or receptor sites. Uh, and then we have a number of uh, kind of novel genes that are new genes, fusion transcripts, and uh, intergenic. Uh, but normally, these are not uh, many. Um, so, uh, the SCANTI will generate a report with a lot of uh, graphs, a lot of information, uh, but basically, as I mentioned, we have all these uh, uh, number of features that we are uh, recording for, for each uh, transcript and for each junction. Um, there are a number of them that are especially important in, in order to assess the quality of the data, like uh, poly uh, intrapriming. Uh, we look at the junction categories, uh, whether it's canonical or non-canonical, and uh, also the r 2 c effects. Uh, many of these things are artifacts that uh, happen during the library construction rather than uh, during the sequencing. Um, so, for example, what we see is that uh, these uh, intra, uh, poly A intraprimate effects uh, normally happen in antisense transcripts of a genic uh, new gene, so probably these are uh, artifacts uh, uh, in the data. And uh, of uh, the other type of uh, um, transcripts, the ones that we uh, thing that uh, are a uh, good candidate, what we see is that in general, we are having non-canonical uh, junctions and uh, lack of coverage by uh, short reads in those transcripts in the novel not in catalog category, remember, with the novel donor and, and acceptors. So with this information, we develop a machine learning uh, filter that will not explain the details here. But basically, what we are able to do is to remove some of the transcripts in the different uh, categories. And the major effect of that is that we increase the percentage of uh, full splice matches. So these are the, 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 the bona fide transcripts. And some other things, like, for example, the novel noting catalogs normally are very much removed, although no. Uh, uh, completely. But we do find uh, quite a, a number of uh, novel in catalog. So these are the novel combination of uh, junctions even in a, in a transcriptome like uh, the mouse transcriptome. Things that we can do then with this uh, data, for example, what we have seen is that we have a lot of, uh, of these novel uh, transcripts that correspond to alternative uh, polyadenylation sites, like here. So this will be a pack by your read. Um, this will be the reference transcript, and this is another pack bio uh, uh, transcript. And uh, we can see that this uh, uh, alternative polarization is not present in the reference. The consequence, uh, the consequence of that is that when we quantify uh, this, this gene just simply using the traditional uh, Illumina reads, we will get, uh, uh, as, as, as expressed transcript, this one here. Well, actually, what we know is that it are these other two the ones that are expressed. So this kind of improvement in quantification is achieved when you have a, a good uh, uh, reference. Um, oh, OK. So uh, some other things. Oh, sorry. And how do I go back? It's kind of slow. OK. Some other things that we. <laughs> It's kind of delayed. Okay, 
So some uh, other things that we see is that norm normally we are having uh, quite a number of uh, um, skipped exons uh, in these uh, novel genes, but also most importantly is that we are able to recapitulate the biology of the system with this novel isoform. So here you are seeing that uh, uh, our progenitor uh, cells, if we only consider novel transcript, will be here while the others uh, uh, are progressing as differentiation progresses in the PCA. So, um, sorry for this. Okay, come on. All right. So, the uh, summary of this part is that. Uh, uh, so we have created this uh, SCANTI software, which is uh, this uh, flexible fr framework for the evaluation of uh, PAC biotranscripts. Uh, recapitulates many bona fide transcripts and uh, indicates uh, which one you should keep. And uh, I think it's important to realize that uh, uh, quantification uh, with this PAC bioreference is a better way to, to estimate uh, uh, gene expression levels. Um, the next uh, um, development is isoanod. And uh, so basically what we have been doing here is to generate a series of a, a pipeline that will generate a lot of uh, uh, functional levels, both at the coding part of the transcripts and uh, also at the non-coding part of the transcripts. And we do this by combining, combining a number of algorithms and databases. And uh, these uh, contain both methods for uh, uh, based on sequence uh, prediction, for example, uh, motifs as UTRs or uh, uh, repeated regions or, for example, PFAM domains of uh, uh, localization signals. Uh, but also uh, we do uh, uh, transference of uh, uh, annotations from a genome coordinates. And with that, for example, we can annotate um, PTMs, we can annotate uh, uh, microRNA binding sites and some other features. Um, at the end, we created this kind of file, which is a GFF3-like format in which all the information is put together. And uh, basically what we find is that uh, uh, we are able to recapitulate with our pipeline a lot of uh, the information uh, that is already uh, uh, known in, in databases with the prediction methods. So this will represent uh, the information that is obtained by prediction and by transference. So for example, some of the uh, annotations is, uh, uh, are based only in, in transference, but some others uh, may, may have uh, uh, both systems to generate the, the information. Uh, normally what we get is uh, a good coverage of annotations both in unknown and novel transcripts. Although uh, normally the known isoforms will have a little bit more uh, set of uh, uh, labels and this is uh, normally we believe is uh, because uh, uh, known transcripts tend to be longer than the, the novel isoforms. Uh, we have generated all this information for mouse, uh, uh, human, uh, some plasm species, and uh, drosophila, and this is uh, available uh, in our tools. And uh, normally we are having uh, something like uh, between 90, 80, and uh, 90 percent of our transcripts will have information uh, with this uh, set of labels. Um, so this is a working pipeline now. We are uh, uh, also uh, uh, doing uh, further work in trying to uh, make it fully automated and extensible to uh, other organisms, and I will show you some uh, results of uh, how this uh, looks like in the next tool, which is uh, uh, TAPAS uh, for the statistical analysis. So basically, uh, in TAPAS, what we are trying to do is to combine these two things, right? So what we have is uh, our G models defined by uh, PacBio, this functional annotation that we obtain, and then some quantification of a uh, gene expression that can be done before it was with, uh, with the Illumina reads, and probably now it's uh, uh, easier to get that uh, also with the long reads. Um, we have a number of modules implemented here. Some of them will uh, look into the potential of uh, a functional diversity that we have across isoforms. Then we have some modules for doing the traditional uh, differential uh, expression and isoform uh, analysis. And then we have um, a set of tools that are very uh, much tailored to uh, understand how uh, isoform changes are uh, impacted the inclusion of uh, uh, functional motifs. 
Um, the tool is complemented with these beautiful graphs in which uh, we have per gene, we have the different transcripts that are present. This will be uh, all the kind of annotations at the transcript level. Uh, these are the uh, uh, CDS or the coding region, and then here you can see uh, the annotations that we have in the coding region. For example, here you can see that there is an uh, exon skipping on the coding sequence that corresponds to uh, the exclusion of inclusion of a functional domain. So which kind of analysis, novel analysis, we have implemented? So the functional diversity analysis is one of them. Uh, so basically here what we uh, assess is uh, when we have a gene with several transcripts and we have all the functional labels, uh, which of them are uh, uh, what we call not varying, so meaning that they are included in all the different transcripts, and which one of them are changing, are varying, because these are the function, the, these are the functional elements that can have an impact on the biology of, of this gene when there is a change in the expression of the transcripts. So, if we look uh, how many uh, of this diversity we have, uh, for example, in mouse. Um, we, we create a, a graph like this, so this will be uh, the representation of the different databases that we have implemented, and this is the number of genes uh, with multiple isoforms that have uh, uh, annotations here, and uh, the darker uh, bar indicates how many of them have this variability status uh, across the transcript of the same gene. So you can see, for example, that the length of the UTR tend to be very varying in uh, multi-isoform genes, but for example, PFAM domains are also uh, changing in uh, about 60% of, uh, of uh, transcripts. Uh, other kind of tools are more in the statistics, and uh, this is how we look at the data, so we can uh, analyze uh, splicing changes, okay? So that will be a gene that changes the expression of isoform, so this is a, a differential isoform usage. But we like also to see to the, mag we like to, to look at the magnitude of this difference. We call this the total isoform usage change, uh, because that gives us an idea of how, how strong are those differences uh, in splicing. Um, some other things that we do is also to look into the filtering of low express isoforms because we have a lot of cases in which this, we see patterns like this, in which we have a gene that changes expression with different isoforms, but actually there is only one minor isoform that is uh, uh, maintained, is, does not change while the other does. So we believe this is more like a change in the, in the expression level rather than a, an alternative uh, um, splicing event. Um, so, um, if we now look to this data, to our data, uh, we have a number of, of, uh, of uh, beautiful plots to illustrate this. So this is one of them that I like a lot because this represents, um, the, this, this is a representation of the log fold change, uh, so the change in expression of each gene versus the uh, usage, change, usage change. So this is indicating changes at the level of gene expression, and this is indicating changes at the level of splicing. And you can see that there are quite a number of genes that have very high uh, changes at the level of, uh, of uh, the used uh, isoforms, okay, that will be here, but actually having a very low fold change, so meaning that these genes will be missed if you just do a, a gene expression analysis. And then when we look at our data, uh, we see that in general we have more changes in gene expression than changing in the splicing, okay? Of our changes in the splicing, we have that most of them Im impact the coding region, so we can evaluate also uh, which, which are the splicing events that impact the coding region, but actually only a fraction of them create these switching events, so it really is uh, creating that differences in which is the major isoform that is being expressed. So meaning that uh, at the end of the day, you, you like to have this kind of tools to be able to concentrate on these changes that really are more uh, likely to have a strong functional impact. Another kind of graph that, uh, that uh, we create uh, with, uh, with these tools is uh, this one in which we can see the, uh, the different terms that are enriched by differential isoform usage and differential gene expression to see which is the contribution of transcriptional and transcriptional uh, regulation to the changes and to, to the regulation of different biological processes. You can see that in many cases there is a, 
a strong contribution of gene expression, but actually there are also, for example, RNA binding is one of the processes in which splicing pay, plays a more important role uh, in regulation of this uh, process. Um, and finally, another kind of uh, analysis that we, we do is what we call the uh, 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 feature differential inclusion analysis. So basically here, what we are trying to do is to really look at uh, features, functional features that change uh, in the isoforms, um, which is the, the, the overall balance uh, between one condition and another. So what we do is to collapse all the uh, isoforms that include a particular feature, for example, the orange one here, and the uh, isoforms that exclude this feature, okay? So once we have that, we can perform a differential test to evaluate whether in general the feature is more or less uh, included across conditions. So when we do that, we find very interesting things. For example, uh, we can see that um, uh, elements like uh, microRNA binding uh, sites uh, tend to be uh, very much differentially included uh, when we consider different uh, differences in expression of isoforms. Also, upstream open reading frames, uh, disordered regions, and PFAM domains are the most significant ones. Um, it's also interesting to see that uh, uh, when we look into differentiation, so this, uh, this will represent uh, uh, progenitor cells in blue and oligodendrocytes in orange. So this is uh, the uh, per percentage of times in which the functional feature is included. So you can see that we, in general, have more functional features in the differentiated cells than in the progenitor. So meaning that the progression of differentiation tends to incorporate functional elements in the expressed transcripts. However, these changes are not strong. They are not really, really big. If we look again to the, this total usage change, in general, we have like values of uh, around 20%. So 20% is around the switch that we have between one isoform and another. And only in a few cases, we have uh, bigger changes. Uh, and finally, we can also analyze whether we have co-inclusion of co-exclusion of elements. So it's, this is indicated some kind of uh, functional coordinations uh, uh, across motifs. And, and again, we see, we see things interesting, like for example, we have uh, nuclear localization signals tend to be very much co-included with, uh, with uh, phosphorylation sites or, or also disorder regions. And I was uh, mentioning before, uh, one of the things that we can do with TAPAS, so all these analyses are, do, uh, are done with this tool, is to find genes for uh, further valida validation, so pr prioritize which genes we want to look at, and this is an example of this. So this is a uh, catenin uh, delta 1 gene, which is an isoform that is um, expressed with uh, four different transcripts, and these are the transcript uh, views uh, in TAPAS. And what we have here is that uh, there is a, a, a differential uh, included exon in this region, and the uh, presence of uh, absence of the exons created uh, that a nuclear localization uh, signal is included or excluded. Um, this nuclear localization signal, what we find is that um, tends to be uh, changes from uh, neural progenitor cells to oligodendrocytes, meaning that in the neural progenitor cells we have less inclusion of this uh, type of uh, isoforms. So we can then go to the lab and then uh, do a, a simple Western analysis in which we uh, extract the nuclear and the, the cytosolic fractions uh, in these cells and then uh, see that effectively we have uh, uh, an inclusion in the nuclear uh, uh, fraction uh, for uh, OPCs while it's excluded in MPCs, uh, while the, the cytosolic fractions is more or less uh, equal. So then we have the proof of this uh, change of splicing. And uh, so this is basically uh, uh, the type of uh, tools and the methods that we are uh, creating to analyze this data. So I think that uh, this is a, uh, a good uh, um, set of uh, uh, resources uh, to, to go into really uh, functional isotranscriptomic uh, analysis. Uh, so you are welcome to, to try them and, and, and tell me what you think. 
And uh, finally, this is uh, the people that have been involved uh, in the lab. I mentioned that uh, Hector, Lorena, and Manu were major contributors, but uh, also the people of my lab in Spain and Florida have been uh, very much uh, actively participated in the project. And just one last thing. I was uh, presenting this, uh, this work uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the users meeting in, in, in Leiden in the Netherlands uh, at the beginning of the summer and uh, they were asking the presenters to have a haiku for their talk. So I had to think of a haiku for the idea of uh, doing this functional ISO transcriptomics analysis. Uh, uh, so that will be the FIT. And I think that uh, you can get fit with Kappas. <laughs> Thank you.